Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled DSF and FTIR as Complementary Methods for the Identification and Characterization of Vaccine Products, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine, and presented by Marina Kirkadets, Deputy Director, Head of Biophysics and Confirmation Unit, Analytical R&D Biochemistry, Sanofi Pasteur, and Rena Decor, President of, at Biotools. My name is Stephen Edwards, and I will be the moderator. Now, please allow me to first introduce our, our first presenter, Marina Kirkadets, Deputy Director, Head of Biophysics and Confirmation Unit, Analytical R&D Biochemistry at Sanofi Pasteur. Marina Kirkadets is Head of Biophysics and Confirmation Unit at Biochemistry Platform, Analytical R&D North America, Sanofi Pasteur Limited, Toronto, Canada. She has 15 years of experience in the vaccine industry. Marina received her PhD in Biological Sciences at the Institute of Protein Research, Russian Academy of Sciences, Pacino, Russia, and her MBA from the University of Phoenix, Arizona, USA. Marina's main focus is characterization of vaccine components, specifically protein confirmation and stability in solution and in advanced form. Welcome, Marina. I'll have to be over, handing over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. I would like to take the opportunity and uh, thank organizers, um, Adam Young from uh, Biopharma Asia, uh, for inviting me to do this, and for Stephen Edwards for all the preparations and uh, practice. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really um, happy today to uh, speak about um, our recent uh, um, <clears throat> observations and results that we got using nano-DSF technology and uh, FTIR. Um, and um, basically, in a few uh, upcoming slides, you, um, I'll try to share um, the results that we collected on our adsorbed samples, so adjuvanted samples for protein antigens that are key components um, of our vaccines, combination vaccines. Um, so basically, if we move forward, um, so the purpose of the study is to gain knowledge about the adjuvant surfaces and uh, antigen protein distribution. Um, and uh, also to examine the effects of adjuvants on protein um, antigen structure and stability, and also um, develop link techniques um, for drug uh, product identification. And so um, we basically have more description there, which is linked to lot-to-lot -lot consistency and product expiry date. And also, um, I think the goal is to have sensitive time efficient methods uh, for final product, vaccine product identification. Um, so uh, to um, make it a little bit more, um, let's say, visualized for the audience, uh, we have a few slides that are um, dedicated to application of scanning electron microscopy um, and elemental analysis uh, of the um, adsorbed surfaces, such as uh, adsorbed drug substances, in our case, it's protein. So the, uh, the next slides will be uh, focusing on that. So um, basically the goal is to check the morphology um, and see if morphology of adjuvant um, is the same uh, for the protein um, uh, in adsorbed form and whether protein itself makes any changes to that. And also, again, to reiterate structural absorbed proteins and the vaccine identity by FTIR. We're talking about drug product here and thermal stability of other proteins by nano-DSF. So um, that's the outline. So as um, previously mentioned, um, SEM, or scanning electron microscopy, we uh, deployed um, in collaboration with York University here in Toronto um, to um, uh, uh, perform characterization of size, shape, and morphology of adjuvant and adsorbed proteins. And on this slide, you can see the um, um, schematic and, and um, of uh, what SEM uh, imaging can do and which modes it can operate. So we uh, basically um, uh, operate um, um, to collect images and we also uh, take a mode of, um, secondary um, electrons uh, to um, basically um, get a report on um, elemental. And so um, on the next slide, yes, and also there is a basically kind of view inside of a microscope what happens, and on the top you see the image of aluminum phosphate. So um, 
I just want to mention that in Sanofi Pasteur and Toronto, we produce uh, aluminum phosphate ourselves, so it's our in-process um, um, adjuvant. And so we have it um, uh, basically prepared from raw materials, and therefore, as um, basically this is a drug substance for all our proteins, uh, we're supposed to characterize it, um, and we do it with rigor um, uh, using also SEM, just to understand um, whether a morphology of the samples or the material we produce here is um, similar to basically what is normally um, known about aluminum phosphate and what's available in literature. And so you can see here that uh, morphology of, of the uh, um, surface presented here is um, similar to um, literature data that you can easily find on the web for, for, this, uh, for this type of material. So um, basically on the next slide, um, we take um, a low vacuum uh, scanning electron microscopy imaging, and um, uh, the purpose is uh, to basically get a highlight. I think it's um, uh, you're looking now at the three micron uh, for micron resolution, and uh, so basically we see that um, addition of proteins somewhat um, um, affects the ability of uh, um, adjuvant to assemble. So, for example, on um, uh, diphtheria, it tends to be more like uh, small islands. Um, when we go closer, um, it's even surface, but um, with some pores. Uh, whereas for tetanus, the pea is more dense and even more so dense for um, a filamentous hemagglutinin. However, main conclusion here that morphology of aluminum phosphate itself does not change. It's basically the same as before. Um, it has, uh, if you zoom in, which is on the next slide, it's um, um, kind of created from uh, small particles and uh, they assemble together, making surfaces, and the particles uh, appear to be um, round or spherical or elongated shape. Um, they are morphous, but uh, nevertheless, like, uh, if you zoom into, you can uh, judge uh, about the particles. Interesting observation was here that uh, we know that some of our proteins, uh, for example, diphtheria, filamentous uh, uh, hemagglutinin, and tetanus, um, uh, toxoid, they basically absorb well. And so um, we're looking at um, between 70 to 90 percent absorption for most part. And so um, in this case, what we saw is that uh, the images became uh, less uh, conductive and appear less sharp. Uh, so uh, we're making conclusion that uh, most likely protein is uh, coating of the aluminum phosphate uh, adjuvant and is distributing itself on the surface. Whereas uh, proteins that tend to have weak um, binding or weak absorption, um, uh, for example, protactin, which is PRN here, fimbria, and uh, PT, protactin toxoid, um, we observe as um, basically having no impact on the sharpness of images. So they appear just as would um, um, aluminum phosphate appear by itself. However, um, the tendency is nevertheless to see them more like an island and continuum uh, surfaces and then breaks and so forth. Um, so uh, basically this statement has to be checked and therefore we start uh, thinking, okay, which mode we're supposed to operate. So if you go to elemental analysis um, a mode, uh, so uh, in this situation you're getting uh, the images, um, uh, same images, but you're getting the um, elemental analysis of in, in these images. So uh, what uh, was important for us to find that we confirmed, that in this case it's diphtheria presented here, that we, we can detect presence of nitrogen in this, uh, in this image, which is um, basically confirmatory of uh, protein presence on it. So when we see the, uh, the surface is coated, we, we, de we detect uh, nitrogen. Whereas for the surfaces that shown above, um, uh, it's not in this slide, just so you know, we kind of keep it concise. Um, and the uh, nitrogen is not detected. So uh, for the weaker binding proteins, obviously there is no surface binding with aluminum phosphate and um, they're not in the high concentration to be, to be detected. So that, that event was confirmed and so basically um, uh, we, we're confident in our conclusions that it's indeed so. Now, um, basically, in, uh, in conclusion, uh, what we learned that aluminum phosphate suspension is really uh, complex. We normally see it as a very cloudy, uh, amorphous um, um, uh, suspension that doesn't sediment for a long time. 
and so um but basically ab ab uh, apart from that um it's hard to judge what you're working on so basically with help of SEM and EDS we we learned that suspension consists of small submicron um particles and uh, they form continuous porous surfaces and um overall morphology of aluminum phosphate alone and uh, aluminum phosphate with the adjuvanted proteins it's um, uh, the same and doesn't change. Elemental analysis um, uh, confirms that um, uh, the crystalline feature we see is uh, uh, from sodium chloride. You, saw, you, you observed that if you look on the slide back, uh, you see that uh, both sodium and chloride present in quite abundance. And this is the uh, result of reaction of aluminum chloride and sodium phosphate when you're making um, the aluminum phosphate suspension in-house. Um, so, uh, for m future studies or for most of the studies that we conducted after, we decided to rinse the samples just to clear it from uh, excess of, alum of sodium uh, chloride in the sample. And then we detect both nitrogen and carbon, which confirms presence of adsorbed protein. But I think more emphasis we put on nitrogen because carbon source can come from other places, from silica as well. So it's um, mm, uh, less definitive, whereas nitrogen is definitive for protein. Then on the next slide, we'll go on in um, FTIR, basically um, the main purpose of the talk today. So uh, Fourier uh, infrared transform um, uh, spectroscopy, uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy is uh, used for analysis of adsorbed uh, protein antigens. We also have it um, here in house as a uh, raw material uh, identification as well. Um, and so, um, basically, the um, foundation or um, the rationale um, why we use it is uh, because it um, uh, identifies compounds based on their unique vibration energies of the molecular bonds, and um, um, normally for biologicals, is used to estimate secondary structure in proteins. But uh, frankly, FTIR goes far beyond uh, just um, the secondary structure. And just for, for this particular topic, that's what we're interested. But as you can see on the slide, um, for uh, fimbria proteins shown here, we see large peak um, in the um, uh, 1,200 to 1,000 region um, uh, on the lower panel, uh, which is uh, PO uh, peak, and uh, that contributes to the uh, section where we normally observe uh, aluminum phosphate contribution. So uh, what we learned uh, here that um, if you compare uh, Fimbri alone, meaning um, a Fimbri in solution um, after purification and the Fimbri adsorbed to aluminum phosphate, we see an increase in beta sheet content um, and it's above the uh, typical error we observe in experiments, so we, we consider that it's uh, um, indeed, um, perhaps um, uh, adsorption to, uh, or uh, we know that it doesn't absorb strongly, so um, basically um, the presence of the aluminum surface kind of um, stimulates um, uh, perhaps folding of uh, some portion of the embryo. Not significantly, but um, about 5-6% five, five, extra you have, we acknowledge it, it happens. And then um, the next one was the diphtheria toxoid and tetanus toxoid. Uh, so the two panels, so we see both uh, amide 1 and amide 2 regions present in the, uh, um, in case of um, proteins in solution. Once you absorb, the, uh, um, we only detect amide 1 region, amide 2 is very shallow. Uh, and then um, very strong signal comes from aluminum phosphate, which is expected. On uh, a filament of hemagglutinin, we see in both cases, um, the one peak, second peak is very small. I mean, the MI2 region is very, um, the peak is very small. Um, and however, after adsorption, again, you see presence of aluminum phosphate peak. And uh, um, basically, um, um, using the uh, quant 2 program that is, um, as, um, is part of the, um, of the software, um, we can calculate that uh, basically we see increase increase in both alpha helix and beta sheet in case of this period tetanus and increase in beta sheet content in case of FHA. Again, it's not significant increase, but nevertheless, uh, it's um, above the um, typical error, which is about 45%. Okay, so um, if you um, zoom in individual spectra, or basically overlay first, and then zoom in individual spectra using fourth derivative, you see the, the differences between them. What we observed that um, Portasis proteins, uh, which is uh, Fimbria, PRN, 
um, and uh, protecting and um, FHA. Um, they have some similarities in the overall shape, whereas uh, diphtheria and, uh, and tetanus, they have um, more kind of rounded shape. But um, I don't think it sells much uh, really on an aluminum side, but uh, nevertheless, um, points on some subtle differences between um, the samples that um, potentially can be used as a differentiating factor between them. It's not really a purpose, but it's just um, uh, opportunity to acknowledge the technique uh, such as FTIR has the power to um, differentiate between uh, the drug substance samples. And so um, I think in conclusion, there is a, a highlight that low frequency region um, consists mainly for contributions of low uh, adjuvant and buffer, and uh, whereas the um, um, fourth derivative really highlights the regions around 16. Uh, 24 um, um, or inverse centimeters, 1676 and 1654, um, where we really can highlight the differences. Um, more interesting situation we we see when we uh, work with um, drug products. So here is a PDSL, Pentacel, and Quadracel drug products that are manufactured here. So basically, it's combo vaccines that um, consists um, of um, proteins that we we just uh, discussed. Um, the six proteins the present in all of these vaccines. However, in some of them we have um, um, also poliovirus present, but as we know, poliovirus is not absorbed, but nevertheless present in solution. Um, and so um, uh, basically um, formula is somewhat different between them. If you're interested, you can zoom and they're publicly available in terms of protein concentrations. But obviously, since you have six proteins and they're quite abundant um, and, and uh, present in all three, uh, the question is they must be very similar. In fact, they are similar. However, uh, by FTIR, you see subtle differences between them. And so um, those differences that can be highlighted in the peak um, observed at 1420, at the peak um, uh, 14, uh, 14 uh, inverse centimeters, and, uh, um, and also uh, peaks uh, at 1079 and 1083. And so um, if you're so interested, um, of there is a publication in Farm, um, Farm Fox Asia, uh, which is um, listed here, uh, where you can um, um, also see the second derivatives that we discussed there, which highlights the differences between vaccines. So for us, it was a um, very interesting observation, um, a very interesting finding, and uh, we shared it with colleagues that, you know, potentially FTIR is very simple, straightforward technique, doesn't need to um, man manipulate or modify sample in any manner. You just load the suspension, give um, perhaps um, a minute uh, for it to sediment, and then start measurement, and you can differentiate between both products. It comes handy when you work um, in different buildings, um, if you need to ship bugs into different sites or across the sea, um, uh, you, you may want to have in your uh, panel of techniques uh, something, something very simple, straightforward to uh, check or verify the identity of bulk product before you uh, start filling and packaging. So um, that's basically the uh, um, main uh, finding and main um, uh, conclusion here. Um, now, now, why we look into nano DSF scanning um, uh, fluorimetry or nano DSF? Um, uh, basically, um, nano DSF is a fluorescence-based method. It doesn't collect the full spectrum uh, as you would do in normal, um, and normally when you measure intrinsic uh, uh, fluorescence signal um, emission um, uh, signal from the protein. But um, what it does, it collects the ratio between um, uh, 300 and, um, and uh, 50 and 330 nanometers and uh, reports this ratio. And so um, um, by that, we can judge about um, unfolding of the protein, uh, aggregation of the protein. Um, we can uh, work with the aqueous samples in solution, and we can also work with absorbed samples. And that, that the second part, the absorbed samples, becomes very attractive because normally I think um, there is a lot of um, discussion in literature and we also contributed to that, that um, um, for um, technological reasons, um, um, researchers for many years, they were focusing predominantly on 
proteins and solutions. Um, now with development of technologies, new applications such as the Nano DSF and development of TIR, um, making more sensitive, more user friendly, we can analyze absorbed proteins. And uh, why is such an interest? Because we at drug substance or drug product level where our impact is um, uh, stronger. Um, the um, basically criticality um, having these samples characterized uh, increases. And so um, when we can really say something about drug substance and drug product um, stages in the manufacturing, these uh, methods become more uh, prominent, more visible, and more valuable. And from that perspective, actually, we started to look into non dsf Obviously, method offers much more than just this. So here, just to familiarize, um, um, it requires very small amount of sample, just 10 microliters. Um, it uh, focuses on uh, fluorescent residue, the change in the environment of, of uh, aromatic fluorophore, mainly tyrosine and tryptophan. And uh, um, we collect um, quite quickly. We can do one degree per minute, two degree per minute, up to five degree per minute scan. And uh, we can collect TM of uh, unfolding and refolding and also delta G. Delta G you have to do though using uh, urea guanidine. If you just do thermal scan, then you just have TM. Um, obviously, the um, uh, profiles which you see on the uh, top panel in both cases on the left and on the right, they can be either um, kind of positive or negative, but in both cases they will report a change. It's either you have um, um, aromatic residues hi hidden from the buffer or they become more exposed uh, to the buffer once you have unfolding process. So in this case, we started uh, with, um, on the left-hand side, you can see the panel uh, with um, um, toxins and uh, toxoids. So basically it's um, initial purified proteins uh, for one of our vaccines and, um, uh, and then the toxoid, meaning um, they treated with formaldehyde and become um, uh, neutralized or uh, basically can be used as toxoids uh, to, uh, in vaccine, safe to use. So um, what we see here, we see change in um, thermal stability and uh, uh, we also have in-house DS DSC method where we can compare all our findings with this and uh, basically confirm that it's trending the same way. Um, there is subtle difference between DSC and nano-DSF um, in terms of um, value or TM value that you can get. Um, in some instances, it's a one degree or half a degree difference. In some, it's probably two to three degree, depending on the protein. In this case, um, for toxins, we got um, a two degree um, a lower than in the DSC and for toxo, it's basically the same. Um, on the right hand side, more interesting stories. This is two toxoids that you see um, as um, dark blue and brown on the left hand side. Um, they are mixed together, it's a certain ratio, and they make a um, basically unadjuvanted drug product. Um, this is shown in red on the, re uh, on the right hand side panel, lower panel. And then the uh, black one is um, uh, the adsorbed uh, to aluminum hydroxide. So it's two toxoids adsorbed to aluminum hydroxide. What we found here that um, the stability of the therm overall thermal stability doesn't change. So the um, peak nevertheless becomes a little bit more broad. Um, uh, so we're thinking that because of uh, uh, adsorption to aluminum hydroxide, the, uh, the, um, um, it becomes more polydispersed and that contributes to broadening of the signal. But the um, main conclusion here that uh, overall thermal stability for these samples is, doesn't change. So which basically means that you can confirm at the very last stage, it's basically the stage which, you know, can be administered to patients. And at this stage, you still can check by analytical tools such as by physical tools. And it's really, um, I think, um, great for us that we can, can, can contribute all the way through to the uh, final stages of the uh, um, uh, drug product manufacturing. So um, on the next slide, um, we're looking now at the individual uh, protein antigens, in this case tetanus, toxoid, and protactin. You probably recall the images of those uh, by SEM and um, uh, also uh, FTIR uh, profiles collected for those. Um, so what we did here, we basically um, plotted thermal stability um, up to two months time point. So um, some of them done at four degree. Um, if you zoom in, you will see um, like a lighter um, cyan color um, at the beginning for tetanus, which is on the left hand side, and um, uh, light brown. Um, those ones are um, at um, 
two to eight degree storage. However, once you uh, keep it at uh, 25 degree and um, uh, higher, um, the um, thermal stability starts to shift. But it's interesting that for tetanus, the whole uh, population of the molecules um, decreases in its uh, thermal stability. So uh, from um, another technique, uh, differential scan calorimetry, we know that um, you can basically uh, go up to three months at um, 45 degree and it's stable. Uh, but here we were interested to compare the data with DSC and also to, to show that um, absorb, we can measure absorbed sample because in DSC you, you can only measure the in solution sample and compare again like we did for the previous slide on the previous slide compare the uh, solution versus absorbed form. <clears throat> so for that us that was conclusion that trending similar way as the, you would see in this in solution. For protecting the story is a little different. Um, the TM as you can see on the main peak doesn't really change. Um, it uh, stays the same for quite some time. Um, so, however, um, we know by DSC the uh, NFLP decreases significantly, and here we see decrease in intensity as the uh, uh, temperature and time progress. So we also see a subtle small peak on DSC. It's more prominent here. It's very small. It's around 68, uh, 66 degrees. But uh, nevertheless, its presence is detectable. So again, um, in DSC we check protecting in solution. Here it's absorbed in absorbed form. So basically, our main conclusion is that um, nano-DSF uh, could be used uh, for all uh, absorbed proteins. And in some cases, um, for new vaccines, we find that it, it can be used for their final drug product. Um, for the vaccines presented here, we checked nano-DSF. It, it doesn't show any signal. And we know why, because uh, we have um, three proteins there that um, do not contribute um, uh, to DS, uh, in DSC as well. And so because they in, um, their concentration is quite uh, high, um, their overall signal is flat. Um, in a different formulations, you may see, uh, like in um, one of the slides before, um, that even uh, for drug products, you can have uh, thermal stability detected. So overall conclusions, I think, um, would be um, uh, good to kind of summarize all the uh, findings that we have uh, today. That um, first of all, aluminum phosphate suspension consists of small submicron particles, and we have um, basically uh, the tools to analyze it um, uh, with in collaboration with York University, but also we have in-house tools to uh, follow up with a secondary structure. Um, content and um, thermal stability or basically reporting torture structure uh, such as nano-DSF. And um, um, that um, stability of the um, absorbed um, uh, proteins um, shown here like tetanus and pertactin and also the uh, um, uh, new vaccine uh, shown on the uh, slide um, basically previously, we see that the thermal stability is comparable with in-solution samples. Um, for FTIR, I think I want to highlight here that um, uh, main finding is that it's capable to produce a uh, um, signature spectrum that is unique for each vaccine product tested, and uh, it can be used as a link technique for final vaccine product identification. And so um, that's basically where I think I want to go to the uh, thank you slide, um, which is to highlight uh, Sunofi Star team. So, um, uh, a great deal of contribution for nano DSF development and um, uh, publication, which is the reference there in, in Biopharma, is Kristen Kalpsvich. Um, she was a co op student here at Sanofi from Seneca College, and uh, uh, she completed her term, and uh, now she's working in um, um, uh, industry. It's um, um, a flake um, packaging. And so she's using her skills to um, to test um, uh, the uh, polymers there. Um, a great contribution is by Sasmit Dashmuk. Um, uh, he's working with us as associate scientist, and uh, uh, his um, work on FTIR is highlighted here. But um, uh, during the years, um, uh, Kamal um, uh, Kamal Jit Bandal and Ibrahim Durovodju they helped a lot with uh, um, uh, juvenile samples and with aluminum uh, phosphate. Um, uh, alone, and then uh, Webster McCullough uh, for our joint sample as well. Wayne, he's our guru on FTIR internally. Uh, Bruce, our director in biochemistry, 
Um, and then also um, um, Arun, Arun Chalam, he's our collaborator and in Swiss Water, some of, also some of his store. Uh, he worked on this um, uh, new vaccine, that slide that uh, I showed first after another DSF. And Danielle Johnson, Danielle Chapman, Liana Sampoliano, it's our manufacturing uh, technology uh, colleagues who basically provided a great deal of adjuvanted samples. Uh, help, thank, uh, thanks to them, we had samples to test and uh, analyze and, and learn so much. And our York University team is Moria Moore, which is postdoc and now for Ontario Center of Excellence um, grant. And Silvia Moran, she's a professor um, in the Department of Chemistry and uh, Moriam's supervisor. And thanks to those two ladies, we learned about um, the application of scanning electron microscopy and also the EDS mode that allows you to do elemental analysis. So basically, um, uh, a great deal of um, different opportunities that we explore together on absorbed sample and also on the adjuvant itself. And so uh, with that, I would um, pass now to Rina Ducor from BioTools, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. Um, once again, just like to interject, I'd like to remind our viewers that there will be a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to send in your questions at any time during the presentation via the questions tab located below the webinar screen, and we will go through these at the end of the presentation. Now please allow me to introduce our second speaker, Rena Ducour, the president at Biotool. Rena Ducour is the president at Biotools, a company she co-founded with Professor Lawrence Naffy in 2000. Rena received a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Illinois, Chicago in 1991. Her thesis explored vibrational circular dichroism, VCD, of biological molecules. Upon graduation, Rena joined Amoco's Diagnostic Division of Vices, now part of Abbott, where she established a spectroscopy laboratory focused on proteins and nucleic acids. While in industry, she pioneered the in introduction of aqueous infrared spectroscopy to the biopharmaceutical industry through the development of instrumentation, sampling techniques, and software for protein secondary structure determination. Her methodology, commercialized as PROTA, is now used by close to 100 of the leading biopharmaceutical companies. She's pioneered the development of reflection infrared micro spectroscopy for cancer diagnostics. And by bringing VCD to the market, Rena helped cement the use of VCD by major pharmaceutical companies for the determination of absolute configuration of chiral pharmaceuticals which has truly become one of the most talked about techniques for chiral analysis. Rena has co-authored over 60 peer-reviewed papers, several review chapters, and is a holder of four patents. Dr. Decor is a recipient of several awards, including Lifetime Achievement Award from the University of Illinois and the William Wright Award from the Pittsburgh Conference. Rena serves on several boards, including the Board of Visitors for LAS College at UIC IBC of Scripps, Florida, and advisory board of companies and scientific organizations. I will now be handing over to our second presenter. Welcome, Rena. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the beautiful introduction. And I would also like to thank Adam and you, Stephen, for inviting me and for all your support, and Marina for the great presentation. You're going to be a hard act to follow. Uh, everybody on the line, thank you very much for your time to spend with us. What I would like to do is to elaborate just a little bit on what Marina so beautifully introduced already, which is an FTIR spectroscopy for looking at the structure of uh, proteins. And I will also tell you just a little bit little bit about other vibrational spectroscopy techniques, specifically about Raman and ROA, uh, but again, I'll concentrate on FTIR. So Biotools is a, as a company is um, located in Florida. We specialize in two things, structure characterization of chiral drugs and biological drugs. That's pretty much what we do. Again, you're welcome to visit when you're in Florida, but we do have over 20 distributors worldwide. Uh, Asia is, uh, is, a, is a big um, territory for us. We have uh, direct people in China, Korea, Japan, and so on. So we look forward to working with you as well. Uh, we also um, have centers of chirality that's mostly for smaller chiral molecules in Europe and in China and uh, to come is India and Brazil. 
So our techniques are all vibrational spectroscopy, starting with FTIR of proteins and other biomolecules, uh, vibrational circular dichroism, Raman, uh, ROA, and so on. So to, just to show you a little bit of a picture, this is the technique I will talk about. This is our proto, uh, proto system that was mentioned earlier and other, other products, uh, other instrumentation. Okay. Uh, let me just go through that. Okay, so there are actually four techniques in vibrational spectroscopy that can be used for both secondary and tertiary structure. Marina talked about FTIR, which is used only for secondary structure. Raman spectroscopy can provide information on second and tertiary. Uh, VCD is secondary, and Raman optical activity goes secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, sort of a global, uh, most sensitive technique, as I will hopefully show you. So why do we use vibrational? spectroscopy. Uh, first of all, it's because we can get information on structure, but also because we can use uh, all kinds of formulations. We can look at low concentration, uh, maybe like um, uh, uh, bidurian type molecules, and we can look at very high concentration on biologics all the way 200 milligrams, 300 milligrams. We do not have a limit on high concentration. In fact, we can study molecules in all the different states, from liquid to solid to gel to colloid on a chip, on, um, on all the different types of membranes. So vibrational spectroscopy allows you to study the molecule in its original state. We can also study samples in their uh, in their unique and natural, um, or not natural, in their formulated states with all the different excipients, which is not so easy for other techniques, for example, like circular dichroism. Okay, um, so the spectroscopy is very structure rich. We have the whole region to look at. Uh, you saw in Marina slides, we can go from 2000 uh, and even above all the way to maybe 400 wave numbers, so 800 depending on the detector. So we have lots and lots of bands. Those bands tell us about secondary structure, but they also tell us about the contaminants. They tell us about what's happening with the excipients. They tell us about the potential excipient uh, protein interaction. But if we add CD on top of IR, which is now called vibrational CD or Raman optical activity, we also get a stereo sensitive information for the structure. So we now have stereo structure rich, and that's why there is an unusual sensitivity to protein higher order structure with those techniques. So I will borrow the slides from um, Dr. Emily Schachter. They're available on light, uh, online. They're, this is from her 2016, I believe, presentation when she was still with FDA. And I like to show her slides for a particular reason. They're all the techniques that are listed which can be used for, this is just an example, for stability studies. Uh, and I put in the red square uh, circular dichroism Fourier transform spectroscopy. So FDA already uh, in their guidelines has spectroscopy, and so that's why you see a lot of spectroscopic studies because spectroscopy tells us about structure. Okay, and of course, many of you are familiar with this. Uh, this is from another presentation by Dr. Sherman. Uh, and this pyramid st tells us that the structure and functional characterization are both very important. So it's called the totality of evidence. So we do have to study structure. It's not just function. The structure has to be studied. And as you probably know and have heard just now, FTIR is now an established method. Many, 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 many companies use it. But the problem is that not many systems out there have the stability and the sensitivity that is needed to measure the protein spectrum. And when I say that, I want to back it up with a couple of uh, published uh, papers. Both of these are from literature, but neither one of the spectra can be used for structural elucidation. The problem on the spectra to the left is that there is a lot of noise. This is all noise, and so when you do second derivative, or as the case in Marina's, she did a fourth derivative, you simply cannot do that because the noise will be ex ex amplified. In this case, the amide 1 band, which is now to the right instead of to the left, is, is lower than amide 2. And so there is a definitive absorption to the ATR crystal. And so this uh, spectra also cannot be used for looking at the secondary structure. If you take anything from this presentation, I'd like you to take this slide. Um, and that is that the correct spectrum matters. Everybody can get an IR spectrum, but to get the correct spectrum is very, very important, especially if you're submitting to regulatory agencies. You need to have all of these parameters, including the ratio of the 
amide 1 to 2 band, the presence of the amide 3, the presence of the CH stretching both modes, the flat baseline, the gradual baseline, right, and no vapor bands, otherwise the spectrum cannot be used. If you're in doubt, I will be happy to look at your spectrum. I will be happy to help you figure out how to get the right spectrum. Why do most people um, not have a good spectrum? Um, and what is needed to get a good one? We need an instrument stability, usually, uh, while well, including thermal. You need the sensitivity of the detector, and most important, the linearity of the system and the detector. Now, why uh, why do most people, well, not most, why do people have an incorrect spectra? Why is there incorrect spectra in the literature? That's the way to say it. Majority of the reasons it's an incorrect buffer subtraction, uh, not compensating for, vap for water vapor, not compensating for excipients of formulation mix, uh, mix matrix. A lot of people are mixing ATR data with the transmission. They show liquids with ATR, I mean liquids with uh, uh, transmission, solids with ATR, and so on. There is interference of side chain amino acids. And simply people sometimes use the wrong region of the spectra for structure. So let me just show you a couple of the examples. This is what the protein in water looks like. This is actually a higher concentration. This is 20 mix per mil. There is your amide 1 band. There is your amide 2. But the water is a, has a huge overlap in exactly the same region as amide 1. And so if you under subtract the water, you're going to get the amide 1 to 2 ratio wrong and the uh, this whole baseline not correct. If you over subtract, you're going to get this negative band close to the amide one. The perfect spectrum is in the middle, and that's how you know when you have a perfect spectrum. Why does it matter? Because if you normalize, you can see there is lots and lots of structural difference, and on the second derivative, you see differences, and the, this will result in incorrect secondary structure prediction, which can vary as much as 14%. So if you look at the normal over subtracted and under subtracted, they range by higher than the arrow of the FTIR structural predictions, which are usually plus minus 3%. So in this case, this incorrect subtraction of buffer results in the incorrect prediction of secondary structure. So I urge you, if you use FTIR, to please be very careful with subtraction. I also want to show you the protein and the water vapor. This spectrum looks almost perfect because it doesn't look like there is any water vapor. But if you expand in that region, you can see all of the sharp bands are due to nothing but water vapor. And if you don't subtract them, you're going to see extra peaks in the second derivative. The other uh, thing I want to mention, I, have, I see over and over people cutting their spectra between 1,700 and 1,600 wave numbers. If you do that, you will not see aggregation. The aggregation band is below 1,600 wave numbers or not the aggregation band, but what we attribute often to the aggregation. So it's very important to look not only uh, below 1700 but above to make sure that the noise and the water vapor are not there. And it's important to look all the way to 1550 to make sure you get the aggregation bands in there. So what is PROTA? PROTA 3S, uh, we say that it's uh, 3S stands for speed sensitivity and simplicity. It's an FTIR spectrometer that is specifically made for looking at the structure of biologics, um, specifically specifically um, you know, bisimilars, biologics, and so on. It's a, we, it's a spectrometer that gives you that sensitivity, but more important, there is a knowledge that gives you the correct results. Uh, so it's not just a spectrometer. It has a lot of things in it. It includes, the, obviously, the spectrometer itself, a dedicated software, the protein database, and hands-on training, and specific liquid cells accessories that help you measure the FTIR spectrum of proteins in solutions. So, um, it comes with an MCT detector, which allows it uh, to do very fast measurements, one to two minutes. And the sensitivity is as high as uh, ability to measure 0.1 mic per mil of sample, especially on the map, maybe even lower. It allows for multiple spectral processing and so on. So it has a lot of algorithms to co for comparability and uh, a secondary structure calculation. This is what it looks like. It's very simple. It's lots and lots of people have used it, as uh, Stephen said, over hundreds of companies. So all you have to do is click on the buttons, and it will uh, give you the results. This is what the database looks like, and it's simply I'm showing it here to show you that uh, proteins like alpha helix and highly beta sheet proteins have a completely different FTIR spectrum. So it is very simple to differentiate small changes in the protein spectrum um, from the FTIR. It, it comes with accessories 
Biocell, it can be used with any FTIR. It's actually our, our number one selling product. It doesn't have a spacer uh, that's physical. It's etched out, so it's specifically designed for doing spectroscopy, specifically FTIR and CD spectroscopy of samples in water. You just put a few microliters of sample on the bottom window, you put the top window, you put them together, and off you go. And of course, there are temperature control options that go with that. Okay, it's a maintenance-free spectrometer. The, the laser is good for 20 years. It's a source for 10. And um, I want to move through. I only have a few minutes. This is an example of a bidurin uh, compared to a new formulation of biosimilar to it. And you can see how beautiful the spectra are even at 1 milligram per milliliter. Here is a spectrum at 1 mg, 0.25 mg per mil. So you can see uh, how nice the spectrum is, it, even at very, very low concentration. And uh, the the software gives you all of these results, so it's all automatic. Um, let me see. Stephen, I have five more minutes, so how many mi minutes do I have? I think I have five minutes. Okay, so let me switch gears just a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about Raman applications. Raman is very well known uh, in pharmaceutical industry. It's used in PAD, contaminant analysis, polymorphism, but it's barely used for looking at protein structure, especially higher order structure. And people ask me that all the time. Why Raman has existed for so many years? Why is nobody using it for structure? And I think my only answer is that because there hasn't been really good systems out there and people haven't shown what can be done. And so that's my goal here right now. Uh, Raman has many advantages. It shows not only information on secondary structure, it also shows information on disulfide bonds and all of the different aromatics. It can be used, it's an ideal technique for comparability, stability formulations, contaminant analysis, and biologics counterfeit. This is what a Raman spectrum looks like. This is just to compare to FTIR. We have the full region. Uh, again, we can go from 2000. In this case, we can go even lower to 400 wave numbers. We get amide 1, we get the bands and tryptophan phenylalanine, tyrosine tryptophan. We have disulfide bond information. So we have lots of bands again, and we don't just concentrate on the amide 1 and 2 because we have a lot of information now. Uh, just like with IR, we can identify bands uh, depending on conformation. We can identify local environment and conformers for disulfide bonds. This is actually very important and very interesting um, to look at them. The first paper on this came out from the Amgen group from Dr. Stiensheng and Sensei Li, where they took uh, IgG1 and IgG2 and did stress degradation studies and compared them uh, using a variety of vibrational spectroscopy techniques. So um, all of this, all of these techniques. And I'll just show you a couple of examples with their permission. Um, this is pH 4 and 3 for IgG1, and this is the same for IgG2. You can see that IR, well, in the paper, IR data shows the same results. The Raman data shows pretty much the same results. But this new technique, which I haven't had time to talk about, called ROA, Raman Optical Activity, actually shows huge differences between pH 7 and 3. And that's because it has a sensitivity to the whole global structure to the whole sort of bowl. Um, we can get information on disulfide bonds, as I said, uh, be mentioned before. Um, this is another example. This is a case, what I call a case of three lots. This is an existing uh, monoclonal antibody that's on the market. This is two different lots, lots one, two, and three. And the FTIR spectrum looks identical. The second derivative also looks identical. The Raman spectrum has a little few differences here in disulfide bonds, and there is maybe just a tiny little differences. But the ROA spectrum looks different. So this new technique that I'm trying to introduce in conjunction with Raman um, has an increased sensitivity to uh, small changes in spectrum. Uh, there is a paper that was published by Merck, by Dr. Gisa um, Siagorjan. You can look it up, or I'll be happy um, to, to show you that. Uh, she also presented the data a couple of years ago at the Bioprocessing Summit. And her conclusion was, so they did, they took a MAB, uh, MAB1, and lyophilized it, reconstituted it at 50 degrees, up to, and stored it up to, uh, incubated it at 50 degrees up to four weeks, used all of these techniques, and this was their conclusion slide, or her conclusion slide. Raman ROA showed differences of sensitivity up to one week, uh, at one week. Only extrinsic fluorescence was faster at three days, but Raman ROA was not measured at three days. All other techniques did not show any changes up at 
all the way up to three weeks. So you can see the sensitivity uh, is very, very high. And I think with that, oh, there is a, also an example from BMS, which was, which was presented at AAPS. There is Raman spectrum, again, lots and lots of details, small differences in disulfide bonds. But if you look at ROA, it actually confirms that they have uh, differences, instability between different batches. Okay. And I think with that, I will conclude. Um, and hopefully I was able to demonstrate that vibrational spectroscopy is very powerful for looking at uh, conformation of specifically proteins, but it's true for other biological molecules, no matter if you're studying uh, you know, glycoproteins or nucleic acid or um, just carbohydrates. Um, you can see a lot of information from vibrational techniques. And these new techniques that I've introduced, VCD and ROA, have enhanced, well, I didn't introduce VCD, but ROA have enhanced sensitivity because they they bring stereospecificity that are not available in just IR and Raman. And all four methods are commercially available, so I strongly recommend using all four. And specifically here, um, I thank you for the opportunity to show you the, what Protus 3S can do. And um, we welcome the partnership. You can contact me, and uh, thank you very much again for your, attend uh, for your attention. Thank you, Rena. Now we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar, but once again, I'd like to remind the audience that you can still send your questions in via the questions tab located below the webinar. Now, our first question is, what are the methods that can be used to elucidate higher order structure? Is that for me or for Marina or for anybody? The questions will be for or, uh, for both presenters. Okay. Well. Okay. I guess I can. Marina, do you want to take it or I can answer that? Well, I think what Rina has presented is great. You can go for secondary structure for sure. You can even um, have um, insights by um, Raman optical activity um, by um, uh, to judge about changes in tertiary structure. I think more traditional one, like first comes to mind, uh, differential scanning colorimetry, and we wrote a video paper about it, so we really like the technique. Um, but um, uh, I think um, it's worth mentioning nano DSF because um, if with uh, modern days you can go with smaller volumes, you can get similar information, and you can also do absorbed. Um, and of course, um, CD, circle diacritism, infrared spectroscopy. Um, for secondary structure, uh, for other features um, that FTIR can give that secondary structure, perhaps uh, the circle decorum does not register, I mean, the contribution of adjuvants or excipients. Um, I would say DLS as well, even though it's not um, technically tertiary structure, it's more self-association of the protein and potential aggregation uh, forms that it can exist, um, DLS for sure. Um, and I think... Um, I don't know if you want more specific, uh, that's probably an MR or X-ray, uh, although X-ray um, spectroscopy potentially is more scalable uh, for industrial setting. We have ex examples in Genzyme um, uh, site that they use it extensively, and also at uh, Paris site at Sanofi uh, with Alexi Rak, uh, who uses it extensively and uh, works really well. And MR, perhaps um, the size of the protein would be um, uh, cut off, but uh, uh, for small ones below 40 kilodalton, for sure, you can get definitely more information. And I think uh, mass spec is now tagging along with um, uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange, so you can you can look that too. So Rina, probably you want to add to that? No, I think you covered it. I was, I think, yeah, I think that list that I showed in my slide has all of the techniques. Uh, if you go back to that list, but I think you just covered them all. So. I mean, there is this is a slide from um, Merck for, uh, but I don't think it even had all of the structural ones. The mass spec is not here. Uh, I think the slides from FDA have all of the different techniques as well. So they're available online. There is lots of slides like that, and they list all the potential techniques that they will uh, sort of as a guide. Well, thank you for that. Our next question is, uh, you showed that both FTIR and Raman are important. If we only have a budget for one at the moment, which do you recommend to start with? Okay, that's a hard question, good question, hard question. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're in the formulation department, then probably the FTIR would be the best choice. As Marina showed, you know, if you're looking at different adjuvants, if you're looking at comparison uh, of lyophilized versus reconstituted, if you're looking at comparison of different excipients, definitely FTIR is your first choice because it's so much easier and faster and it's already established. And it's much easier to compare liquids and solids and also like adjuvants or like PLJ, like other deliverable delivery mechanisms or delivery um, uh, molecules in there. So I would say FTIR would be the first choice. But if you're doing comparability or stability between, let's say, an innovator drug versus biosimilar, or if you're doing a signature for a particular molecule, or if you want to understand the full complete structure with uh, the aromatics and side chains, then Raman and hopefully or also ROA uh, would would be recommended. So they kind of overlap because they both tell you, and CD also, uh, I would also say CD is kind of in the same field because if you, you know, they, they all overlap in terms of the answer that they give you, but in terms of the ease of use and how fast you can get the results and what the results really show you uh, in a formulated product and non-formulated, so if it's a drug product versus drug substance, that makes a huge difference on which, on which technique you're using. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what, uh, what other applications of nano DSF are you aware of? Again, well, for my uh, presenters. You can do... Yeah, I think uh, I can elaborate on that a little bit. So we mainly use it for thermal stability, uh, but um, you can also do um, um, stability by um, adding guanidine or urea. In this case, uh, you will prepare samples, um, incubate them. Um, at some point, you will measure them all at once. Um, that allows you quick check. Uh, for the stability of the uh, formulation. So before venturing into um, um, even accelerate stability studies, it's very intense undertaking. A lot of samples, lab, lab time, uh, instrument time, people time, uh, and material, of course. Um, you can do this pre-study to figure out um, which uh, formulation most stable and suits the purpose. And depending on whether it's protein or virus, um, you need um, perhaps biological readout to check, if, for example, that this formulation is indeed what you're looking for. For example, you may find that you know, thermal stability of the formulations are all the same. Now, is that uh, really tells you something or not? Um, potentially not. So uh, then you're looking for other techniques. Uh, if you do guanidine titration, um, potentially you can reveal um, this most suitable formulation faster. Um, we don't deploy it very often, but um, I think we now have more examples of pressure samples, so we're thinking to use that uh, for one of the studies uh, where, you, where you test uh, stability. Um, it's, I would say that uh, this is definitely for pressure samples where you have little amount of material to work with, or um, if it's a really um, tough call when you have to decide between formulations, that would be giving more insights. Uh, from one experiment, so that's really the um, advantage. Yes, I would say that. Uh, also, um, if you work with viral vaccines, a nano DSF works. I mean, um, say, recombinant viruses or um, uh, viruses that are um, treated with formaldehyde, you can find that it. Um Thank you. Our next question. Which FTIR spectral region is used to estimate secondary structure content on, of the protein? Okay. I guess I'll take that. <laughs> okay, yeah. so as both of us showed, the actual region that is used is 1800, to, well, 1750 to uh, 1550. We use, and for all of our customers, we recommend 1800 to 1400 because as I showed, it's very important to get, um, to, to also get the 
uh, the band that that affiliated with aggregation. So if you're looking at the structure, then you need to look at the full region between 1800 and 1400, or at least up to 1550 or 1575 uh, for the second derivative. If you're doing the quantitative uh, secondary structure estimation, the actual region used is between 1715 to 1575, I believe. Okay. Uh, next question. How do FTIR and Raman compare to CD? Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> Okay, so all three are wonderful techniques. CD definitely is very well accepted and greatly used. CD, the advantages of CD are you need very, very low concentrations and it takes small amount of a material which you can uh, easily reuse or get back and it's very very fast and these days you can also do CD in multi with many different samples a lot of uh, there's several different manufacturers who produce that so that's definitely an advantage of CD the disadvantages of CD is that you cannot really do solids yes there are some small some isolated techniques where you can do that you cannot do higher concentration proteins because uh, CD limit and people vary on this, it could be you know, close to maybe 10 mix per mil, so you have to dilute, and if you're diluting, uh, if you're doing a drug, drug substance, it's okay, but if you're doing a drug product, you're diluting all of your excipients, so the interaction between the excipients and the protein could be changed, and so the dilution is not the native state <laughs> of, of your product, your, of your drug product. And the excipients also could be chiral, so many of the excipients, as, as all of you know, have carbohydrates, so you know, sucrose, trillose, and so on, uh, and the chiral excipients will interfere in the CD because it's a chiral method. And so weighing all of those advantages, um, you know, that's why vibrational spectroscopy is used in conjunction with CD. So I am a proponent of using as many techniques as you possibly can. Also, CD measures a longer range interaction between the amide, um, the carbonyls between the amide bonds. It's an I to I plus three, whereas, uh, I'm sorry, it's so I to I plus four, so that's why it's so good for alpha helices, where vibrational spectroscopy techniques are really good for beta sheet, because the dipole-dipole interaction that they measure is I to I plus three, so they get the full beta sheet, whereas the CD gets the full alpha helix, and so that's the difference, that's a fundamental difference between the two techniques. But one thing I'd like to add is if you're doing both techniques, CD, IR, and Raman, and you're doing a secondary structure analysis, please use the same database and the same software, or the same algorithm to calculate secondary structure because otherwise you're comparing apples and peaches. There is a fundamental difference between CD and IR or Raman, uh, but if you also mix into that different databases and different programs, then um, your results just don't make any sense anymore. So, Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, at which stage in manufacturing would you use FTIR to identify the compounds? I think you can do it um, from the beginning to the end. So <clears throat> if you have to characterize or identify raw materials, <clears throat> and these um, raw materials are sensitive and have rich infrared spectrum, um, definitely FTIR can be used for those. And in fact, it's, um, I think um, the, this practice you see more and more in industry. Um, I also have to acknowledge that um, for some raw materials, Raman provides some more rich spectra, more Raman active than FTIR active. And so um, we see um, examples of raw materials that more, have more profound, more rich spectrum in the uh, um, uh, or spectral features in Raman uh, if you use Raman application. So um, I would say, um, for most part, um, FDIR can travel with you throughout the entire manufacturing cycle. Uh, so raw materials, media components. Um, in some cases, uh, we find the Raman is more uh, appropriate, easier to use, um, especially for raw materials media. Uh, but I agree with Rina. For example, we had instances where we could demonstrate the protein is aggregated and it's aggregated in adsorbed form, and uh, it's different from control samples. So you can zoom into the protein structure, protein-antigen structure, 
um, in the, in the um, um, adjuvanted form. And we published paper on TB, TB vaccines, um, also it's available as webinar. Mm, but um, it's really insightful technique. But uh, from what we see, FTIR can basically be a lean technique throughout the entire manufacturing cycle. And you can go as far as drug substance and drug product, just as we discussed earlier. So um, advocate for that, yes, for sure. Yeah, and I agree. It's a FTIR can be used through the whole manufacturing process, all the way from raw material ID through uh, formulation, you know, through identifying drug um, substance, and then through formulations, through quality control. Our proto system is used in all the different stages, um, in including quality control and submissions. Thank you for your answer. Uh, our next question is, could FTIR and slash or nano DSF be used as a method to identify protein components of non-alum containing vaccines like Fluzone? Um, I think you can, um, well, we can all start with trying, right? So you cannot give definitive answer until you see the sample. From what I know by another technique that <clears throat> uh, from colorimetry, you can differentiate between the uh, um, uh, subtypes uh, of uh, vaccine uh, of the um, um, uh, virus that uh, is split virus that is used to, to manufacture fluzone, and uh, they give different thermal stability and different enthalpy. So from that perspective, potentially you can deploy uh, nano DSF successfully using less samples. Uh, to um, um, to differentiate the components by thermal stability. Obviously, we have to be conscious when we say that that this is indirect tool. Yes, it's fast, lean, but it's indirect tool. If you need direct tool, you obviously turn attention to mass spectrometry because that's uh, where you can do peptide mapping and confirm identity for sure. And or, or any other technique that um, uh, looks through, I don't know, genomic-based, which, uh, which will use, uh, be used to confirm identity. But if you need lean technique and quickly differentiate with drug, drug substances, the, the nano-DSF has potential. Um, infrared um, may uh, detect difference, may not, because when we look at proteins, sometimes they don't um, really surface significant difference by FTIR. And I think <clears throat> from Rina's presentation, she saw so many MI1 and MI2 regions, it's hard to uh, distinguish between them. They all absorb and uh, vibrate in this region. Um, FTIR would be difficult to claim as the identification tool from that perspective. If you have any excipients uh, in this compound, uh, in these um, drug substances, you may um, try to see if there is any subtle change that would uh, be a distinguishing factor, but not the protein itself. Um, again, nano DSF, perhaps because of thermal stability, you would be more, um, I think, advantageous there. But as again, consciously, indirect uh, indirect identification tool. So, as a lean, as a lean tool. Um, in terms of uh, when you're combining all, uh, all of them together and uh, comparing between different products, again, one has to see first because um, it's hard to say up front that it will work or not. But presumably different formulation may have subtleties that either FTIR or non dsf will pick up product-wise. Thank you for that. Our last question is, is it possible to receive a certificate of attendance at the end of the event? And yes, I believe that the platform will email you, you one yourself. But if you do wish for something extra, you can contact us using the contact button on our website, biopharma-asia.com, and we'll be able to service you correctly. And I think with that, that concludes the question and answer segment. But before I finish, I would like to ask our presenters, Marina Kirkadets and Rena Decor, if they have any closing remarks. Maybe Rena can go first. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody for your time. And I'm just going to email everybody. Oh, the, oh yeah, you can add it. OK. So my email is available if you have any further questions or uh, if I can help anybody with any um, with, to look at the spectrum or anything, uh, please contact me by email or go to our website. Uh, and thank you again to everybody. 
Um, I would like to thank audience some um, interesting questions and um, uh, again uh, thank organizers uh, for this opportunity and it was great to partner with Rina who we know, we, we know each other through many conferences that we attended together and so um, it's, uh, it's a great combination when you can uh, see the application and also different reports from other industrial partners that Rina work together so kind of gives some um, bigger story and bigger perspective on where things can be applied and which technique is more appropriate in certain situations versus others. Um, and um, I would say, um, yeah, I'm looking forward for more opportunities to work together. This is um, great, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, too. me too. <laughs> well, I would like to take this opportunity to thank both of our presenters, Marina Kokadet and Rena Decor, for sharing their knowledge with us. I would like, also like to remind our audience that they can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.